Okay, as a supplemental lecture, let's revisit incompressible substances. We'll just go through, through the theory again um, and then think about how would we calculate, in particular, enthalpy for liquids. Um, so for incompressible substance, the definition of incompressible is the specific volume is not influenced by changes in pressure. So the partial of D with respect to P is zero. Um, in general, if you think about any substance, the specific volume would normally be dependent on two independent properties, so temperature and pressure, for example. If it doesn't depend on pressure, then the specific volume only depends on temperature for an incompressible substance. So this is our logic to say V for a compressed liquid must be the saturated liquid value at the same temperature. Right? Because as the pressure increases for a compressed liquid, um, the specific volume would not be changing. And so find Vf at the same temperature. For internal energy, we would consider U as a function of T and specific volume again, but V, specific volume, is only a function of temperature, therefore U is left to only be a function of temperature. So we use the same logic. U is equal to Uf at the temperature. So no, notice that both of those are not the pressure but the temperature for incompressible substances. So we can go read this right off the table. We don't need compressed liquid tables for this. For enthalpy, it's a little bit different. Enthalpy is defined as U plus PV. And so H is not, so there's a pressure dependence here, excuse me. All right, so H is still a function of T and P. So it doesn't make sense to say that H is equal to HF at the temperature. It's also going to be dependent on P. Sometimes the pressure influence is so small that H is approximately HF at the temperature. But in general, H is not equal to HF at that temperature. So let's talk about enthalpy a little bit. Um, enthalpy, by definition, is U plus PV. So it's just a collection of other properties we're already familiar with. Um, so anytime we wanted to calculate an H, if we had H, a V, and a P, we can just substitute in this formula to have H. We don't have to have separate charts necessarily for enthalpy. Okay, so for incompressible substances, U is only a function of temperature. V is only a function of temperature, so the pressure dependence shows up in this P times V. So H is a function of temperature or pressure is a function of temperature. U is a function of temperature plus P times V is a function of temperature. So this is kind of a, a general expression for incompressible substances. If we took the partial of this equation with respect to temperature while we hold P constant, so the partial of H with respect to T while we hold P constant. Uh, if you take the derivative of this with respect to T while you hold P constant, this doesn't depend on P. So no need for a partial derivative. That's this, the same thing as du dt. The pressure dependence here is P times effectively a constant while we hold T constant. Sorry. The partial of H with respect to T while we hold P constant would be dv dt in this case. The p is constant, so it comes out front. Okay, so we're left with this equation after we take the derivative. This is by definition c sub p. This is by definition c sub v. Okay, so this term will typically be much smaller than this term. The sensitivity of volume to temperature is the thermal expansion coefficient. This is going to be a very, very small number. Um, P times dV would be the boundary work associated with thermal expansion. So in general, we will neglect the boundary work, the work that is occurring because of this very, very small amount of thermal expansion. In fact, just as a comparison, what we could do is use the common denominator here. Right? We're really comparing dU the size of the change of internal energy to PdV, the boundary work associated with thermal expansion, right? So that we're assuming this term is much, much less than that du, um, and which is generally the case. So that is a generally, for most applications, accepted situation, in which case we're left with C sub P 
if this is effectively zero, C sub P is equal to C sub V. All right, so for incompressible substances, C sub P is equal to C sub V, so you might as well just call that a C. There is no difference between a constant pressure specific heat and a constant volume specific heat because we're assuming the density is not changing. Um, okay, so before we now go back to talk about enthalpy, let's talk about internal energy for an incompressible substance. Use a function of T and V. Let's consider changes in internal energy. Take the derivative of this, so the partial with respect to T, dT, plus the partial with respect to V, times dV. So we take the partial with respect to T while we hold V constant. This is kind of implied. don't need to actually add that, but that's what a partial derivative is, right? Take the partial with respect to one variable while the other one's constant. Partial of U with respect to V while T is constant. Um, this term is actually the definition of C sub V, which happens to be also C sub P or just C for incompressible. This term is the partial of U with respect to specific volume while T is constant, but specific volume is a function of temperature, which is not changing, so this is zero. Um, so we're left with, for the internal energy change of an incompressible substance, it's just C dT. All right, so integrate that U2 minus U1 is an integral of C dT, remembering that that C is actually a function of temperature. Um, if you assume constant specific heats, go get C, look up C at the average temperature. C average times delta T then is an approximation for the change in internal energy. Or you don't need to assume constant specific heats, right? We know that C2 is UF at T2. U1 is UF at T1. U2 is UF at T1. So we can evaluate these. And so this is from the tables, and so not assuming constant specific heat. So we would say uh, that's the variable specific heat just means you use the tables. All right, so use whichever one of these is um, convenient, knowing that this one actually is an approximation. Let's put an approximately equal to on that one. Okay, so now let's go back and think about enthalpy, changes in enthalpy. H is U plus PV, so DH is equal to DU plus the derivative of PV. Now we could separate this with the product rule, derivative of the first times the second plus derivative of the second times the first, but these are properties, so they're not path dependent quantities being properties. So it's easy to evaluate this, right? This would be H2 minus H1 on the left side easy to integrate this. This would be H2 minus H1 on the left, U2 minus U1 after we integrate that. This one would be P2V2 minus P1V1 after we integrate that. And well this is pretty straightforward because just by the definition of H we could substitute directly into these and have that expression. Okay, now what I want to do is apply this concept of a change of enthalpy between two points on the saturation tables, one point being um, the saturated liquid value and another point being some state in a uh, compressed liquid or liquid state or subcooled liquid state. Um, so if it is purely incompressible then for this isotherm this is a vertical line through this portion because the temperature is not changing so the specific volume then would not be changing. All right, so this line actually is an isotherm correspond to the temperature at T1. So V1 and VF at the temperature T1 are the same. This corresponds to the saturation pressure at T1. Of course, the pressure P1 being a compressed liquid will be larger than PSAT at T1. So use the equation up above H2 minus H1, except now this is our effective H2, this is our effective H1, and do a substitution. We'll end up with H1 minus HF equals U1 minus UF plus P1V1 minus PSAT VF at those temperatures, right? Um, on that isotherm, the change in U is zero, and V1 and VF are equal, so those can, those can be factored out. Take this HF to the other side, and we have the equation you're already familiar with for H1. H1 is equal to HF 
plus this additional term associated with the pressure. So this is where that pressure dependence comes in uh, for H. Now often this term is much much smaller than that term because that specific volume is a small number for liquids. This pressure really has to be hugely higher than P sat before this term becomes a significant contributor to H. But often that's the case. The pressure is very high. That is the case. But in general, it is not true to say H1 is equal to HF at T. You have to include this other term and then make a decision on whether or not you're going to neglect it. If you have some rationale to neglect it, cross it out and put your communicate your reason for crossing that out. Otherwise, you need to just keep that. If you don't know any difference, then you have to keep this. This is the definition of H. Okay, so in a couple of the problems that we just worked, in your homework number eight, they were considering a liquid at one location that passed through a pump, for example, and then when it leaves at the exit, it's still a liquid. So we can talk about evaluating the enthalpy change for a liquid, so from a liquid state to a liquid state. Um, so let's go back to for an incompressible substance, H is equal to U plus PV, and then that U and that V only depend on temperature. Take a derivative again with respect to H. Our derivative would be the partial with respect to T times DT plus the partial with respect to P times DP as a definition of a full derivative. Again, that's going to be C, so P, which is just C, and that's V, both functions of temperature. So make those substitutions. DH is just equal to DU or CDT plus VDP. So here's that extra little pressure dependence for H. Now integrate that. H2 minus H1 is U2 minus U1 for this. And so this last term is the integral of VDP. So if we assume that V is not changing, although the temperature could be changing a little bit, and so there could be a little bit of thermal expansion. If we neglect that thermal expansion, take that V outside, then that integral can be approximated as V P2 times the pressure change. Um, so that for that V, you can use whichever of the two, VF at T1 or VF at T2. We're assuming it's negligible, so these should be very, very close numbers. We're neglecting the effect of the thermal expansion in this case. So in, I think it was problem 470, there was an evaluation of the enthalpy change. And so this, this could, where you're assuming constant density or constant specific volume, so this could have been used to evaluate delta H in that problem. Um, alternatively, uh, we could use the same uh, definition, H is equal to U plus PV, and then for an incompressible substance, U is UF at the temperature, V is VF at that temperature, do a direct substitution for H. And so H2 minus H1 would be the change in U plus P2V2 minus P1V1. We can use these evaluations rather than assuming these are equal and factoring them out. So this is effectively not neglecting thermal expansion in an equivalent way to evaluate things. Um, it's just particularly inconvenient if you don't know a T2, for example, because then you have two properties here to depend on a T2. Um, so if you, for example, don't know one of the pressures, let's go back up here to this one. If you don't know one of the temperatures, let's say you're using this equation to solve for the temperature at 2, for example. So if you know the temperature at 1, you can evaluate that, use V1 here, and now you can use U2 um, to give you T2. Okay, so finally, in summary, for incompressible substances, U is UF at T. U only depends on temperature. DU is C times DT. C equals C sub P or C sub V. Specific volume also only depends on temperature, so that's VF at the temperature. H it depends on pressure as well, so H is equal to U at the temperature plus P times V at the temperature. So UF at T 
plus P times V F at T. So this expression, actually, I did not have in your notes previously. Um, I think the textbook maybe thinks of that as being obvious. I'm not sure, but I will definitely add that uh, to the class, a more in-depth discussion of incompressible liquids and how to evaluate H. Um, this is an expression that we already had for evaluating H right, with the chart from, of the saturation tables. And by comparison, for an ideal gas, C sub P is not equal to C sub V. In fact, C sub P equals C sub V plus R, where that's the gas constant for the particular gas you're considering. DU is related to CV DT. DH is related to CP DT. So there's a connection C sub P and H and C sub V and U. However, you can evaluate U and H from the ideal gas tables. Since you have tables, this is considered variable specific heats or if you assume constant specific heats and integrate this equation for du u2 minus u1 is just c sub v times delta t or for h delta h is equal to c sub p times delta t so again c sub p with the h c sub v with the u all right so that is a little bit different than although there are some similarities for example u is a function of t only for incompressible and for an ideal gas. Um, H is a function of temperature and pressure for incompressible substances. For an ideal gas, H is still only a function of temperature. Okay, so that concludes um, some extra or complementary, I guess, um, discussion of incompressible substances and evaluating enthalpy.